Now we'll discuss sympatholytics, also known as adrenergic blockers. We'll discuss them separately for both alpha and beta receptors. Firstly, we'll see the alpha adrenergic blockers. These blockers can be divided into those which are non-selective for both alpha 1 and alpha 2. Those are selective for alpha 1 and those which are selective for alpha 2. The non-selective ones can further be divided into the irreversible ones and the reversible ones. The irreversible are irreversible because they are non-competitive antagonists and covalently bond to the receptor so they are also long acting and cannot be reversed. The chief drug that is included in this class is phenoxybenzamine. It has two effects mainly. Firstly, it will cause vasodilation by inhibiting alpha-1 receptor and thus decreasing blood pressure and it also has an effect to inhibit the reuptake of uh, norepinephrine. Now this is not very sympatholytic in, in its effects but this will lead to the side effects that is increased heart rate, palpitations and the chance of arrhythmias. The drug phenoxybenzamine is preferred in few chromocytoma. The reason is because if we use a reversible blocker in few chromocytoma and we know it's a, uh, it's a tumor of the adrenal medulla so that means the, it will be releasing loads and loads of catecholamines. So if there are too much of the catecholamines then the reversible blocker will be reversed that is it will, it will let go of the receptor and the agonists will act that is the catecholamines will act. So in that case we need an irreversible blocker that cannot be reversed by high concentration of catecholamines. Second use is before managing to decrease the heart rate with beta blockers, we use uh, alpha 1 blockers, alpha blockers that is phenoxybenzamine because if we give beta blockers first then the alpha 1 effects would be predominant and the beta 2 effects will not be there and thus alpha 1 effects will cause vasoconstriction leading to worsening of the hypertension. So we give alpha 1 blocker first and then give a beta blocker for tachycardia. Coming to the reversible ones, they are reversible because they are competitive antagonists at the alpha receptors and that's why they are short acting. The one drug that we'll discuss here is fentolamine and it is mainly used in hypertensive episodes and in emergency cases because it is short acting and rapid acting. It can also be used in a few chromocytoma associated hypertensive episodes, also in male sexual dysfunction where it will uh, inhibit the alpha-1 receptor and lead to uh, vasodilation. It can also be used in tissue necrosis, which is due to the alpha-1 receptor causing vasoconstriction. And also in peripheral vascular diseases, because uh, in that case we don't want the alpha-1 receptor to act, uh, to act and cause vasoconstriction, worsening the peripheral vascular disease. Next are the selective alpha-1 blockers. And as they do not inhibit the reuptake of norepinephrine, like the irreversible non-selective sympatholytics, that's why they are not associated with the side effects such as tachycardia, palpitations, and arrhythmias. What they do is they cause the dilation of both arteries and the veins. Now, one phenomena that you need to remember for selective alpha-1 blockers is the first dose phenomena. This is actually uh, because of the alpha-1 blockade that causes postural hypotension. So you need to warn the patient before starting uh, him or her on alpha-1 blockers. You need to tell him that take this dose at bedtime or when you're lying down and not getting up because uh, this will lead to hypotension and thus can lead to uh, decreased blood flow to the brain and thus syncope. So in order to prevent the patient from falls and injuries, you need to tell the patient to take this dose uh, at bedtime. The drugs included in this class are prezosin, terazosin, doxazosin, which is the longest acting, tamsulosin, and alfuzosin. Both tamsulosin and alfuzosin have a U in their name and they are uroselective. If you remember, I mentioned in the receptor video that alpha 1 has further some types that is alpha 1a, alpha 1b and alpha 1d. Uh, I only mentioned alpha 1a and I said that it's present in the prostatic urethra where it contracts the urethra. 
Now, by, by blocking this receptor via alpha-1 uh, blockers, we can use this uh, in benign prostatic hyperplasia just for symptomatic treatment to prevent the urinary stasis and ease of urination. And one important thing is that if you think benign prostatic hyperplasia is a disease of older males and they're probably uh, suffering from hypertension as well. So alpha-1 selective blocker is a good drug to give in these patients because it will do two jobs. One, it will deal with symptomatic treatment of BPH and secondly, it will look after the hypertension. A side effect of alpha-1 selective blockers is retrograde ejaculation. That means the semen goes into the bladder. Lastly, we have the selective alpha-2 blockers and they include the drugs euhimbine and mirtazapine. Now, euhimbine is a competitive antagonist of alpha-2 uh, receptors and it was used previously in the past as aphrodisiac but now it's rarely used. And mirtazapine we have already mentioned in antidepressants and it also causes weight gain. So it will be an ideal drug to give to anorexic depressed patients uh, so that they also increase their appetite. Coming to the beta adrenergic blockade, you will see that we'll use drugs that mainly block the beta 1 receptor that is predominant in the heart and kidneys and also in the aqueous humor of the eye but not much about beta 2 blockade because if you think about it beta 2 blockade will cause vasoconstriction leading to increased total peripheral resistance can lead to bronchospasm in asthmatics and vasospasm in vasospastic disorders and other metabolic effects so we don't find a, a good uses of uh, beta 2 blockade so we have drugs that will either non-selectively inhibit both beta 1 and beta 2 some will be selective for beta 1 and the others will be uh, beta blockers but will have agonistic activity for beta 2 because we are more benefited by beta 2 agonistic activity. These are first generation, second generation and third generation. Coming to the first generation, they are non-selective for beta 1 and beta 2. In the CVS on the heart, it will cause depressive effects because of beta 1 blockade decreasing heart rate, decreasing conduction velocity and decreasing inotropic effect and also vasoconstriction due to beta 2 blockade. In the respiratory system, it will cause bronchospasm due to beta 2 blockade. It will also decrease stress-related tremors because of inhibiting glycogenolysis in the skeletal muscle and also decrease intraocular pressure by decreasing aqueous humor production. Now let's see what side effects we'll get with these drugs. Firstly, as I said, they cause bronchospasm, that's why they are contraindicated in asthmatics and COPD patients. Secondly, what they do is they mask the hypoglycemic states in diabetics. Now we know hypoglycemia manifests as tachycardia, tremors and palpitations. So whenever a diabetic is taking a beta blocker for some other reason such as hypertension, but he goes into a state of hypoglycemia and manifests those symptoms, but the beta blockers block those symptoms so the patient will not be aware of his state of hypoglycemia and can lead to other problems such as coma and death. So that's why they are not given in diabetics. They are contraindicated in Prince Metal Angina as well because of the beta 2 blockade property causing vasospasm. They are also not given in congestive cardiac failure because we need that beta 1 receptor to work and increase the heart rate and contractility and dromotropic effect as well. Lastly, what they do is uh, they are contraindicated in peripheral vascular disease for the same reason that is they cause vasoconstriction by inhibiting beta 2 receptors. The main drugs involved in this class are propanolol, timolol, nadolol, pindolol and sotalol. We'll discuss their properties after we've seen all of these generations. The next, the second generation beta blockers are selective for beta 1 and they are also known as cardioselective beta blockers. They are, they are preferred in asthmatics and COPD, in diabetics and in peripheral vascular disease patients for all the reasons that first generation are not preferred for these cases. They involve the drugs atenolol, acibutolol, bisoprolol, esmolol and metoprolol. Lastly, we have the third generation beta blockers. 
which have a beta 2 agonistic property as well, so they have additional vasodilatory effects too. They are classified into the non-selective and selective again. The non-selective ones include uh, labetolol and carbidolol, while the selective ones include betaxolol and seliprolol, also nebivolol. Now I'll put some, some of these drugs in some boxes and those will be the drugs that have a membrane stabilizing effect, that is they have quinidine-like properties that uh, we've, we will study in cardiac arrhythmics chapter because they have, a, have an ability to stabilize neuronal membranes so that they can act as antiarrhythmics as well. These drugs are propanolol, pindolol, acibutolol, metoprolol, labetalol, and carbidolol. Those that will be in the green boxes, the light green boxes, have an intrinsic sympathomimetic activity. That means that they are partial agonists at these receptors, at adrenergic receptors as well, and will mimic the effects of epinephrine and norepinephrine, and they can increase the blood pressure and heart rate. So these drugs are pindolol, acibutolol, labetalol, and seliprolol. Coming to some specific properties for separate drugs, uh, for propanolol you need to know that it causes CNS depression and should not be given with drugs which cause CNS depression as well such as benzodiazepines or alcohol or even antihistamines. They have decreased poten potency. Sotolol is used as an antiarrhythmic. Atinolol has a long half-life and is more potent than propanolol and causes no CNS depression. Esmolol is a very short-acting uh, beta blocker, about 10 minutes, and can be used in hypertensive emergencies and also in supraventricular tachycardia emergencies. Regarding labetalol, it is preferred in congestive heart failure. Carvedilol is cardioprotective. This effect may be attributed to its antioxidant property and thus it causes decreased mortality in CHF patients. Celiprolol has a weak vasodilatory effect as well by releasing nitric oxide. Now we'll see some collective uses of uh, beta blockers. Firstly, they're used in hypertension where they will decrease heart rate and have an effect on remodeling of the left ventricular muscle. They also decrease renin release and thus the renin, angiotensin and aldosterone system will not be activated and thus the blood pressure will not increase. They are also used in angina prophylaxis and MI because they will decrease the oxygen demand of the heart by decreasing contractility. They are also used in arrhythmias because they have a membrane stabilizing effect and mainly they are propanolol, esmolol and acibutolol. They can be used in uh, congestive heart failure because they will inhibit the renin, angiotensin and aldosterone system and thus decrease salt and water retention. They are also used in fucromocytoma and inhibit the effects of the catecholamines that are released on the beta receptors. They are also used in glaucoma because beta 1 receptors on ciliary muscles will be inhibited leading to decreased aqueous humor secretion. Beta blockers also find the use in migraine prophylaxis where they will decrease the cerebral blood vessels tendency to overdilate. They are used in hyperthyroidism, chiefly propanolol where it inhibits the peripheral deiodinase enzyme and thus T4 is not converted into T3. They are also used in essential tremor by inhibiting the beta 2 receptors thus inhibiting glycogenolysis. They can be used in short-term relief of social anxiety symptoms such as tremor, palpitations, tachycardia, sweating, etc. They are also used in hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy so that the heart doesn't work very hard and thus uh, is not the heart muscle doesn't undergo hypertrophy. Lastly, they are also used while dissecting aortic aneurysms so that the heart uh, so that the beta one activity is blocked and systolic blood pressure is not very much increased. Uh, so that the aortic aneurysm can be dissected easily. That's all about sympatholytics.